Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Those reprises get me in trouble every time. We're not doing a reprise, are we, huh? Boy, oh boy, I've jumped up before and come up here, and then there's a reprise. That means they sing it again. Talk about embarrassing. That'll do it to you. Well, for those of you who were here last week and who heard and knew that I tripped over the dog and injured my knee, some of you have expressed grave concern about the dog, and I want you to know she's okay. That's the truth. You think I'm pulling your leg, don't you? No, I'm not. I had a lady walk out last Sunday just as serious as can be, grab my arm and say, and how's the dog? I said, the dog is fine, thank you, and I'm getting better. So, how about that? All right, we're going to take a moment and greet one another, right? See, he left me a note, kind-hearted as he is, and I already forgot. Let's stand and greet one another and welcome each other to the chapel. Well, as soon as you've greeted somebody, you may find your seat. Um, We'll continue in our worship of God. Now, if you want to sit down, you may, but I'm going to ask you to stand for the Scripture reading, um, and that's from Exodus 17. And I realize some people cannot stand. I was asked this question a couple weeks ago. What if we can't stand? And the answer is then don't. But if you can, we ask you to stand out of respect for God's Word. Our scripture reading is from Exodus 17, verses 8 to 16. And we read as follows. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel and Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, choose us some men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. But when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side, the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book. Let me pause to say this is the first time in the Bible that God says, write this. And recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And we'll discuss Amalek's problem in a moment. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is my banner, or Yahweh Nisi. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Thank you. You may be seated, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his own holy word. When I was a child, my father, who taught history at Lake High School, used to take us uh, for a few days every summer to some place of historical significance. And there we would visit uh, often a battle site or Fort Lawrence in New Philly. It didn't have to be far away. Schoenbrunn, I gesture because those are all south, you know, and things like that. And then we would get his history lesson for sure. But one time we went to Washington, D.C. I was in the fifth grade. I can remember it distinctly. Visiting the monuments and hearing about Washington and Jefferson and 
people like that. And then finally we got to the Lincoln Memorial. And I was thoroughly impressed to such an extent that when I returned home, I began reading all I could about Abraham Lincoln. And one thing you know about Lincoln, the Civil War, it led into that. And I became immersed in that for probably 10 or 12 years of my life. One thing I learned about the American Civil War was that the battalions for both armies, Union and Confederate, had their own flag. The Irish battalion in the Union Army had some kind of green flag that was Irish-oriented. The men from Virginia in the Confederate Army had a blue flag that they fought under. It was called the Bonnie Blue Flag, and so on. And when the Lord is here acknowledged as Yahweh Nisi, the Lord is my banner, it would probably be better for us to understand that what is being presented is the Lord is my war flag. I fight under the flag of Yahweh. I fight under the flag of the Lord. One of the more interesting passages of Scripture in the New Testament is found in Ephesians 6, familiar to most of us because as children we put the elements on the soldier <laughs> in our children's area. Put on the whole armor of God. Be strong in the Lord, in the power of His might. In a few moments, we'll return to Exodus 17 and the battle at Rephidim, and we'll see that Moses' hands upraised are symbolic of prayer and soliciting God and asking God for his presence and his help. And when his arms tire and drop, then Amalek wins. And so the symbolism for Israel and for us is very real. When we pray, we win. When we don't pray, we lose, we fail, and are defeated. But this Ephesians 6 passage says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Please remember as introductory words to this armor of God passage that we are invited to draw upon God to draw upon his presence and his power as we go through the various struggles of life. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, and they are wily. If Eve was, and Adam, if Adam and Eve were tricked, when they had not yet sinned and were in a perfect environment, what makes you think you're invulnerable? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, which is his way of saying there are such forces out there that are demonic, and they will defeat you. If you let them, don't let them put on the whole armor of God, stand in God's power. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, the day of temptation. And having done all to stand, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith with which you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God. And then we come to this verse. And there is a redundancy here. Listen for it. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And you say, yeah, that is redundant. In fact, I'm not quite sure how to understand it. What is the intent of saying praying always with all prayer and supplication? The intent is this. 
without prayer, nothing else will work. Prayer is how we get hold of God, to use a phrase from a bygone era. That's how we get hold of God. Prayer invites God's presence into our lives, is the way we would say that today. Prayer invites God's power into our lives. Prayer invites God's wisdom into our life. And that's what Moses is teaching us at Rephidim, the importance of prayer. <clears throat> Here's Moses. He's getting up there in years now, and he finds that as he stands there with his hands up for an extended period of time, that his arms get tired. And when he lets those arms drop, the Amalekites get the upper hand. Now, just who are these Amalekites anyway? Last week, we looked at Israel at the bitter waters of Marah. And we learned that God can take the bitter waters, salt waters, and make them sweet or fresh water. And with that object lesson, God is teaching us that the bitter experience of our lives can teach us something. We can become better people. Now we come to another episode where an outside force, an outside enemy is trying to destroy Israel. That outside enemy, the Amalekites, can represent a variety of forces. The world, the flesh, the devil, we're often told in the New Testament, are our enemies. But those are rather, well, the world is a way of thinking, secularism we call it, or humanism. The devil we know is uh, the tempter, uh, but the flesh, sometimes we wonder about that. I wonder also, as I read from Galatians 5, if these are struggles, if these are Amaleks in your life. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Now, there's a powerful statement from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. You do not do the things that you... You know you can do better. But you don't. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Are these Amaleks in your life adultery or even a desire for another person's mate? Fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred. Are you so angry with another person that you hate that person? If so, it's an Amalek in your life. An enemy out to destroy you. Contentions. Jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. There are some Amaleks to consider. And probably at one time or another, all of us have dealt with an Amalek or two from that list. And if not, then you probably will. What is the answer? Praying always with all prayer and supplication. Moses, get those hands back up. Amalek was the grandson of Esau. You remember Esau, the son of Isaac, the one of whom it is said in the book of Hebrews, he despised his birthright. What that phrase means is that Esau had no use for God. He found God and the things of God despicable. God? Who cares about God? 
Give me a bowl of cabbage, pottage. God? Ha! Who cares about God? Jacob, you just go on and worship God all you want. I don't care about God. That's Esau's attitude. That's Amalek's attitude. And that's why they're attacking Israel in a physical, literal, violent attack. God, you're the people of God. Ha! We'll show you. We don't care about your God. When in an hour of temptation, in the evil day you'll be able to stand, Ephesians 6 says, but in an hour of temptation, in Galatians 5, isn't it true that adultery says, God, forget God. Fornication says, God, forget him. Uncleanness, lewdness, sorcery, hatred. God, God says to forgive, forget it. Get even. I remind you from my counseling ministry, I've told people over the years, you don't know what even is. Don't try to get even. You don't know what it is. Leave it with God. Let God handle it. He's just. It'll work out in the end. God, in a time of outbursts of wrath, God, who cares about God? This is the attitude of the Amalekites. This is the attitude of the flesh. So we look to Moses whose hands are held up by Aaron and Hur, symbolic of calling upon God for his presence and for his help. Aaron is his brother. Hur, tradition tells us, is his brother-in-law married to Miriam, a tradition that precedes the time of Jesus and is probably true. So his brother and his brother-in-law are holding up his arms. Don't you find that in life so often you are your own worst enemy? That after the defeat, whatever it might be, that you think, boy, I wish I'd had the wisdom to call upon God. I accidentally clicked that picture, but it's okay. It was coming up next anyway. Have you ever heard of C.D. Blaylock? Most people have not. It's a sports trivia question. C.D. Blaylock in the 1930s was a boxer on the boxing team at Louisiana State University. He was about six foot seven, the tallest boxer in his weight division. And he was undefeated because of his reach. No one could get in there to, to box him. And with his reach, he could just keep punching the other guy until finally the other guy kind of staggered and pow, came the knockout punch. C.D. Blaylock. Interesting story. And here's why he's known in sports trivia. In a boxing match against Mississippi State University, the opponent from Mississippi State University, same weight division, but a totally different body structure. Little squat guy built like a concrete block. Short reach, but he knew it. And so as they were boxing, the little fellow from Mississippi State would dance away or come in close. C.D. Blaylock saw an opportunity for an uppercut, and he reached back and delivered a terrific uppercut. The Mississippi State boxer saw it coming and ran in, and his head hit C.D. Blaylock's arm, and C.D. Blaylock ended up hitting himself in the nose and knocking himself out. <laughs> the only boxer in history to ever knock himself out C.D. Blaylock. How do you like that? And there he is on the canvas, down for the count. Don't you know that so often, we are our own worst enemy. We end up knocking ourselves out. 
because instead of calling upon God and drawing upon the power and the might that he gives through his presence, as Ephesians 6, 11 says, we try to use our own lusts, our own power, our own strength, our own will. The lesson from Moses at Rephidim is this. Let God fight your battles for you. You do the right thing. You obey God. You fight under his banner. He's the general. You're the soldier. He calls the shots, and you do what he says. And if you are obedient, and if you do what he says, and if you fight under his banner faithfully, then rest assured, the victory will be yours. You will have victory over the world, the flesh, in its various forms, and the devil. That hatred will go away as you learn to forgive. Those outbursts of wrath, you'll learn to control as you bring yourself under the discipline of God's Word. Here is an illustration of the power of prayer that I use frequently in my own life. Peter. Herod, grandson of Herod the Great. Herod the Great is the one who ordered the children killed in Bethlehem at the time of Jesus' birth. His grandson, also named Herod, is the ruler in Acts chapter 12 during the days of the, the Acts of the Apostles. As the church spreads through the Apostles' ministry and through the use of apostolic gifts. I think the book is properly named, by the way. Nearly every commentary I pick up on the book of the Acts, I don't pick up many anymore, but many of those commentaries will say, this book should have been named the Acts of the Holy Spirit, or this book should have been named the Acts of the Church. Uh-uh. Those early church fathers knew what they were doing when they named it the Acts of the Apostles because there were certain gifts restricted to the apostles and their time. Gifts that aren't present in the church today except in tribal, primitive areas where missionaries go and establish churches and there's no word of God. I don't want to restrict God or limit God, but I do want you to know the book is properly named because the apostles had unique gifts that we don't. Having said that, a little Bible lesson there, having said that, in Acts chapter 12, Herod has ordered the execution of James. And James, the half-brother of Jesus, known uh, historically as the gentle saint, has been killed. And so he orders the arrest of Peter, and Peter is to be executed the next day. Well, the church knows this. And the church is in prayer for Peter. And the night before he is to be executed, an angel appears. And Peter, Acts 12 says, thinks that it's a dream. And the angel says, no, this is no dream. Come on, get up, let's go. And they just go walking through the gates and out into the city street. And then the angel leaves him at the home where the church is meeting in prayer. He knocks at the door, one thing leads to another, he's invited in, and they rejoice that their prayers have been answered. God is moved by our prayers. Supplication means praying for my need. Prayer means in general, for the world, for others. And Ephesians 6 says, Pray with all prayer and supplication. We pray for ourselves, supplication. God, move in my life. God, move in my heart. God, change my attitude. Change my mind. God answers prayer. He will move in your life. We pray for others like the church prayed for Peter. And God moves in the lives of others. My wayward child, I pray, bring that child back. God answers prayer. Today, there are those who pray for wayward parents. My wayward parents, bring them back. God brings them back.
Throughout the pages of the Bible, do you know what's very interesting? And I throw this graphic up. We read these stories to our children and read them ourselves, and we think, boy, this is, this is something. Here's a picture of Daniel in the lion's den, spared from the hungry lions. You know what's interesting about that story? Nowhere do we read, sound the trumpets, splash this on the billboards. This is an unusual, spectacular response to prayer. No, it's just taken as a matter of course. God heard our prayer and God answered it. That's what Daniel said. Daniel doesn't say, sound the trumpets, splash it on the billboard, front page news. God answered prayer. No. When the king goes down and says, hey, Daniel, are you there? Did God deliver you? He says, yeah, I'm okay, king. God heard my prayer. I'm okay. God hears and answers prayer. Fourth man in the fire, you know the story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The real key to that is that they're obedient to God. We're not going to bow down to this false idol. We're going to stay true to our God. And if you throw us in the fire, okay. If God delivers us, okay. And if he doesn't, okay. If he allows us to live here a little bit longer, that's fine. If he takes us on to heaven, that's even better. So we don't care. We're going to obey God. In an answer to their prayer and obedience. Here they are. Jesus is with them in the fire. He's the fourth man in the fire. And they are delivered. I'm telling you, prayer invites God's presence and power and wisdom into your life. Uh, crossing of the Red Sea, or I actually think this is the crossing of the Jordan River, where God parts the waters and the people uh, pass through on dry ground. We think, oh, wow, what a miracle. Pages of the Bible don't say, oh, wow. Pages of the Bible say, hey, people prayed, God answered, this is the way it worked. This is the way it works. You pray, God answers. You battle against the Amalekites in your life, pray for God's wisdom. Pray for God's presence. Pray for God's power. And watch the difference that it makes. What do we say about prayer? Because that's what Rephidim is all about in Exodus 17. A symbol of prayer and of calling upon God. What do we say about prayer? First thing we say is prayer is the place where we restore faith and reestablish confidence in God. Is your faith wavering? Is it weak? Pray! This is where we restore our faith. Prayer is a battlefield where the struggle for right desires is fought. Do you vacillate between a right desire and a wrong one? Oh, I, I never do that. Really? <laughs> you must be unique. Most of us do. Pray. Allow God to reveal to you the truth about who you are what you want, right desires versus wrong. Prayer is where God exposes our weakness and his strength. Prayer is where we discover our motives. What is really motivating you? What's motivating you, Pastor Joel? Are you trying to do something here to one-up the church down the road, look better than them? Or are you doing something to glorify God and honor Christ? What's your motive, Pastor Joel? Are you trying to look better than the pastor down in Louisville? Or are you trying to honor Jesus and do the right thing for your community and your church? Prayer is where we learn our motives. Wrestling in prayer is not working against God. It's seeking to fulfill God's will. I wrestled in prayer just Friday. On Wednesday of this past week, I learned that my friend, our friend, a friend to our church and to many of us,
Pastor Dave Bogue from Arlington Memorial Baptist Church was in the Summa Rehab Hospital in Akron. I actually did not know that until Wednesday. Not that I needed to know it necessarily, but I got the information. And I called him. And I got his voicemail, and then next day he called back, and I got his voicemail. That was on Thursday. So on Friday, I went in to see Dave, Friday morning. And uh, he told me he'd had back surgery, and it didn't go well, and he's in severe pain and discomfort and so on. And I told him then, I said, boy, Dave, I sure wish I had apostolic gifts if I did, I'd put my hand on you and say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And I said, I don't have those gifts, but I'm going to pray that way anyway. I'm going to pray that God does something great in your life, that he will either directly intervene in your life and bring healing to your body, or he will bring the people into your life who know what to do to facilitate the healing process. And so we prayed. Now that's wrestling with God in prayer. Asking God to do what you cannot. I go into other people's rooms at the hospital. Some are filled with cancer. I cannot reach into that body and grab that tumor and pull it out. But I can pray that God will do something marvelous for this person or send someone who can. That's wrestling with God in prayer. And if not, then God will bring comfort and peace to this person as he or she prepares to enter eternity. I can pray that prayer as well, and I have many times. I can speak to people who have appalling personal histories of abuse and hurt and pain. I cannot go back and rectify what happened to them, but I can pray that God will give them some kind of psychological and emotional peace and healing so they can get on with their lives. That's wrestling with God in prayer. And when we wrestle with God in prayer, He hears us and He answers. And then we know, Yahweh Nisi, the Lord is my war flag. I live and I fight under His banner because He's there for me and He answers my prayer. There are a lot of things in this world I cannot do. And there are a lot of things you cannot do. But there's one thing we can all do. We can pray. Now, I have a suggestion. And it's based upon my experience because it works for me. I realize it might not work for you. I don't know how you start your day. I don't mind telling. I am just as human as any of you. I hope you know that. I mean, when I get up in the morning, my hair looks like a rat's nest. You know. But the way my day begins is, first thing out of bed, the dogs go outside. <laughs> Next thing, the coffee gets made. Third thing, the dogs come back in. Fourth thing, a cup of coffee gets poured. And then I'm able to sit down and pray. And then for 15 minutes after all that rigmarole, I spend time in the presence of God, praying and asking God to give me wisdom for the day, help for the journey. And one thing I always pray, by the way, and I hope it shows, is that God will enable me today to help one person, at least one person, in the journey of life. May I be an encouragement to one person today and help them in the journey of life. God calls upon us to pray. 
You pray, and I'll act, is the principle God gives in the Bible. You pray, and I'll act. So often we want to say, God, you just do it. And God says, no. You must learn to be dependent upon me. That's the great lesson that prayer gives us. Dependency upon God. And that's the one great lesson above all else God wants to teach us. You are not independent. You are dependent upon your maker. And someday you will answer to him. You pray, and then I'll act. Yahweh Nisi. Fight under the banner of the Lord. God gives us, when we pray, clear thinking, pure motives, right conduct. You ever heard of this fellow? Lord Charles Cornwallis? Of course you have leader of the British troops during the American Revolution. On October 19, 1781, General Cornwallis, who, by the way, later, after the American Revolution, went on to heroic feats in leading the British in battle in India. But Lord Cornwallis, on October 19, 1781, surrendered the British garrison at Yorktown to the American colonial and French troops. Upon surrendering, surrendering the British garrison at Yorktown, Cornwallis gave as his reason for surrendering that his supplies were depleted. But after the British left, the American colonials went into the British garrison, and here is what they found. 144 cannon and mortars. Thousands of big gun cartridges, that means cannonry. 120 barrels of gunpowder. 800 muskets. 266,000 musket balls, bullets. 73,000 pounds of flour. 60,000 pounds of bread. 75,000 pounds of um, dried meat, we would call it jerky, 30,000 bushels of peas, 1,250 gallons of whiskey, and military materials that could have meant the British holding on for months. What happened at Yorktown? The British did not run out of supplies. The British ran out of the will to fight. And when they lost that will, they lost the war. We must continue with the will to seek God, with the will to invite his presence into our lives, with a will to obey and follow after him, with the will to fight the good fight of faith. Let us pray. And as we go to prayer this morning, perhaps there are friends here today who have not made a commitment of faith to Christ as your Savior. Following our benediction, there will be at the front of the worship center Rick and Linda Grissom. They're here to pray with you to help you to answer questions you might have about life, about faith, about the church. Let them do that. As other people go out to the parking lot or down to the children's area to get their child, you just come up to the front of this worship center and speak to Rick or Linda. Dear Father, today we have seen Yahweh Nisi, another defining aspect of God, the God who says, if you will pray, I will act. The God who says, fight under my banner. Learn to love me and obey me and seek me. And you 
will be victorious. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God the Father, and may the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon us all till our Savior come and evermore. Amen. God bless you all. You are dismissed.